Hey, what's up guys? John here. Family Dollar and Dollar Tree will now close 1,000 stores nationwide. Family Dollar and Dollar Tree are set to close nearly 1,000 stores. This comes after the Chesapeake-based firm posted a huge quarterly loss. Walgreens, CVS, right at also closing stores. CVS, the nation's largest pharmacy chain, is now planning to close as many as 900 stores. Rite Aid, the pharmacy chain says it plans to close up to 500 stores as part of its bankruptcy plan. You're hearing of even Macy's closing stores. Walmart is also closing stores. TJ Maxx is closing stores. All of these locations, all of these big box retailers are going out of business or closing stores. And many people would dive to the conclusion that they're doing this due to rampant theft, poor management, record high inflation, a struggling consumer. And all of that would be true to a small capacity. But the big, big truth that's behind all of this is what we all need to pay attention to. Because what is happening, the fall of retail is going to change America as we know it. Because you have to ask yourself, when a Dollar Tree goes out of business or a Walmart goes out of business, who is the buyer? Who is the next buyer that's going to buy that property? Or who's the next tenant that's going to sign that lease? It's nobody that's going to sign a lease at that former price, not in this economic environment. A few years ago, sure. So what does this mean? It means the values of these properties are going to continue to get diminished. Insurance is going to continue to rise as we've seen the last couple of years. Taxes are going to be going up as we've seen the last several years. But more importantly, interest rates are not going down anytime soon. So we're going to see an erosion of the value of these properties and a hidden buyer that's being positioned to take over these assets to repurpose them. I'm going to break this down. I'm going to give you the facts. I'm going to show you word for word on whitehouse.gov how this is all going to work. Please hit the like button. Hit the like button. YouTube will share the content, educate more people about what's really going on in the U.S. economy. And if you'd like to fix your credit, we would love to help you at my company, greatcreditfast.com. That's greatcreditfast.com. If you have late payments, medical bills, charge-offs, foreclosures, bankruptcies, repossessions, or any negative item on your credit report, go to greatcreditfast.com. Click the link in the description just below this video. Schedule a free starting session for tomorrow, for Thursday. Take a look at this. So, I mean, even McDonald's, for example, they're saying that they're catering people making 45 grand a year. Anybody making less than 45 grand is eating at home to make it more affordable. I mean, you're not going through a McDonald's drive through spending less than 20 bucks. Not now anymore. So, look, they say that retail theft is a big problem, right? This is what they claim. They say retail theft is a big problem. You know, losses are swollen to $112 billion, up 19%. In 2021, it was $93.9 billion. Right? You're hearing about you know, grocery stores even going out of business. You're hearing about Macy's. You're hearing about all these stores closing. 4,600 stores closed last year. Right? It's massive. Absolutely massive. But you have to ask yourself, when you look at retail and you look at what CEOs and executives are doing, they're selling stock and they're stepping down from the roles at levels of which we've never before seen. I mean, for example, uh, on CNBC, they said their firm founded that more than 1,500 CEOs have left their posts so far in 2023, making it the highest number of departures since Challenger began tracking it 22 years ago. You know, you're seeing these record high corporate bankruptcies. But here's the big question. Here's the big, uh, the big question mark nobody's looking at. When you see two thirds of all commercial debt, all commercial real estate loans are held by regional banks, and these banks are gonna be struggling to offload this debt because almost $3 trillion, $2.8 trillion in debt has to get refinanced from now until 2028, the next four years, three and a half years, what's gonna happen? Many of these properties, as the rents continue to soften and the costs continue to rise, they're gonna owe a lot more on these properties than they're presently worth. And so when they owe more on these properties than they're worth, who's gonna be the acquirer? Who's gonna buy these assets? Well, according to whitehouse.gov, they say that they are going to, look at this, commercial real estate investment volumes fell 64% year over year in the second quarter of 2023. At the same time, office vacancies reached a 30-year high of 18.2% as shown in the figure. The vacancies persist from coast to coast. The vacancy rate have reduced foot traffic to the office adjacent economy, reducing demand at local businesses, including restaurants, dry cleaners, convenience stores, retailers, and hair salons. A new initiative announced today by the Biden-Harris administration helps accelerate conversions of commercial properties to residential presenting an opportunity to prevent such a loop. Now, many people are gonna to dive to the conclusion that look, there's no way these are properties are gonna get converted to housing, it's way too expensive. And that would make sense, I would agree. If they were gonna do the conversion the way it should be done, where you know a family has their own bathroom, an individual has their own bathroom, they're separate units. But what if I were to tell you that what they are likely going to start to do is they're gonna to start to do dorm room style accommodations where five or six or seven units maybe share one bathroom. And we start to do it that way. 
Because if you have a family dollar and there's one bathroom there and they're able to take that family dollar and put 10 or 15 units and maybe make out another bathroom, you know, all they have to do is throw up some, you know, some two by fours and throw up some uh, drywall and, and they're good to go. Put some electricity in or some uh, recessed lighting in each room, you know, some small little revisions, small tweaks, and they can do that. Now you might say, look, that's not going to happen. It's not going to happen. Well, this New York Times article came out and they said homes with shared kitchens and baths. And this article, it says, what if you lived in an apartment that did not have its own kitchen or bathroom? A New York think tank called Five, Bar Five Borough Institute says such apartments could put a dent in two crises in the same in the city is facing the chronic shortage of housing and the surplus of office space in Manhattan. Five Borough maintains the empty office space would be turned into housing for flexible co-living with communal kitchens and bathrooms. Interesting. Who is Five Borough? Is this a reputable, you know, institute or is this just some, you know, fly by night type of company? Well, let's look at them, right? So Five Borough, you know, here, let's, we'll scroll down here. You see Manhattan Chamber of Commerce, Jessica Walker. You have former New York NYS Supreme Court Justice, right? You have someone from Columbia. Then you have, you know, Jessica from Amazon. You have, uh, you know, people from Microsoft here, you know, Mount Sinai. You're having Kaiser, uh, Kaiser, I mean, the founder of, uh, all these different companies, right? You've seen all these different companies, but when they're when they're bringing out this think tank and they're saying that the solution would be to, they say in, the, in such a report, these conversions would cost less and could be completed faster than conventional office residential conversions. Fiber says there's over 100 million square feet of available office space in Manhattan. That figure could grow as long-term leases go unrenewed, whereas commercial tenants take less space because remote work means fewer employees going to the office. Well, what they're working on is promoting commercial to residential conversions on whitehouse.gov. And they say across the country, commercial vacancies are affecting urban and regional economies. Commercial to residential conversions can counterreact those effects to regeneralize these local economies and add to the supply of housing. The adaptive reuse of these properties also presents an opportunity to create zero emission housing, which will reduce energy costs for residents and cut dangerous climate pollutants, recognizing the opportunity. The Biden-Harris administration is launching new commercial residential conversions. And so they are using federal funds to move forward in this direction to, uh, to push forward on these conversions. So you're seeing that there. Then you're seeing these new opportunities. They're, they're supplying a lot of funds for this as well. So they're, they're already committed $35 billion in just lending capacity. Uh, this came out October 27th on WhatS.gov. Then here, they say grants to cover pre-development, acquisition, construction, and other costs. HUD, Community Development Block, grants program $10 billion, of which have been allocated during this administration, provides grant funding that can be used to support acquisition, rehabilitation associated with conversion of commercial properties to residential uses. States and localities can also access up to five times their annual CBDB or CDBG allocation and low cost loan guarantees to fund projects such as the conversion of properties to housing and mixed use. They also have 85 million pathway, pathway to removing obstacles in the housing program. They have all these different programs that are being you know, allocated and supported right now to move us in that direction. And even here, business insiders are saying turning a tiny fraction of America's dead strip malls could create 700,000 new apartments. And so when you start to see these family dollars and you start to see these neighborhoods change, you have to ask yourself this big question. If a neighborhood is predominantly comprised of, you know, walkability, it's comprised of, you know, local attractions. A lot of people are moving to different locations because they can walk somewhere, you know, maybe they're moving to a certain location because of a school district, they're moving to a certain location, maybe beach access, whatever it may be. People choose a community for a certain reason. Well, if the median income in that community maybe goes from household income of say 125,000, 150,000, and then, you know, a lot of these stores start closing up and then they start bringing in uh, affordable housing. And let's say affordable housing, you know, tenants are making 25,000 or $30,000 a year, and there's thousands of people moving into these communities, well, the obvious would be that local income would fall, right? And so median income would begin to fall. And as median income begins to fall, you would likely begin to see a different type of repricing of single family homes and housing in that neighborhood, right? And so what I believe is gonna happen is since, I mean, look here, they say that they are, they're going for, uh, to revitalize downtowns, New York, DC, San Francisco, 
right? And they want to really issue the commercial to residential conversions, including vacant offices, hotels, and other non-commercial spaces. Proponents of the policies see them as opportunities both to revitalize vacant real estate and address a long-term, long-run supply shortage, which is plaguing the U.S. housing market and contributing to decreased housing affordability. Well, where are all of these locations, right? Where are all these stores? You have the McDonald's, or you know, you have the Macy's, you have the you know Walmart, you have all these retailers. Where are they? Well, they're right here. They're predominantly in cities, right? It says it right there. So that's what I believe is going to happen. We're going to see these banks, these regional banks that are holding two thirds of all of this debt, be forced to unload it to the highest bidder. And who's going to be a higher bidder in the White House that is going to be able to uh, either directly buy or have sponsors that are going to buy on their behalf, and they're going to have the funding because they're going to be they're going to be having access to uh, you know very discounted rates. Like, look at this. Simply the DOT. Similarly, the, the new DOT policies unlock $35 billion available lending capacity for development projects at below market interest rates. So you think about this. You buy this deal, hypothetically. You buy this deal. Maybe it's a $2 million property, right? $2 million property. You, the market rate rent or market rate interest rate might be 7.5%, 7 and a quarter, right? But the White House might offer you, hey, we'll do this for 5%. You're like, okay, 5%. And what could we do here? Oh, we could turn this into housing? with communal bathrooms possibly, or we could do, you know, because they are relaxing zoning policies, relaxing everything to increase housing supply. So you think about this, you'd be able to buy it, finance it at a cheaper rate, and you'd be able to pull more, more money from it. So, I mean, what's gonna happen? I think that's gonna happen. What do you think? Drop below, let's have a conversation about this. If you'd like to fix your credit, to position yourself, what I believe is gonna be the greatest wealth transfer in American history, we'd love to help you at my company, greatcreditfast.com. That's greatcreditfast.com. If you have late payments, medical bills, charge offs, foreclosures, bankruptcies, repossessions, or any negative item in your credit report, go to greatcreditfast.com. Click the link in the description just below the video. Schedule a free, strategy session for tomorrow. See you next video.